Well, Jane Ann, it is a pleasure for me to be here with you today. And I think the last time we were together was when we went to Pelican Bay and had the opportunity to work with Defy. Um, and I want to dive into that experience a little bit. One of your mottos that I noticed on your website is live to give. Yeah. And I have seen you do this personally, uh, both at Pelican Bay and other times in your career and life. But why is that such an important principle to you? I... I believe we've been put on the planet for a purpose and the purpose is to make a difference with our lives and make the planet just a little bit better. And so I believe that it's our responsibility if we're able to be successful, to be successful. And and going to Defy was a wonderful example of that. It was a wonderful example of that. Not only to touch those men lives, but also they touched our lives. So every yeah. one of us came back different. Well, and for those that aren't familiar with that, it's a program. Well, you, you can explain it a little bit. So, so I didn't know what Defy was before we went. Did you? Oh, you didn't? No, I had no clue. Uh, I did. So Dave Crenshaw, who's a mutual friend yeah. of ours, he sent me an email and explained what he had done. And he said, for my birthday, I really want to invite some people to go with me. But So you didn't know what no, we were getting I got, ourselves no, into. I did get that video. And then I spent the weekend watching documentaries on Pelican Bay. Yeah. And so I went with the, the, the thought process I'm going to the most dangerous, the worst prison in America. And uh, and getting in there was a little bit intimidating too. Yeah, well, it's yeah, it's a program where we basically, different business owners and entrepreneurs go in and get to, um, I guess, teach entrepreneurship and help mentor some of the men and women that are incarcerated right, there, that right. are in prison there. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, it was funny because I was very much intrigued with how it was going to go. And it is, it's one of the top security prisons, um, maximum security prisons in the entire United States. Yeah. Um, the only time I'd ever heard of Pelican Bay was in the movie Training Day when he's getting mad at all the other guys and he says, you'll be playing basketball in Pelican right. Bay. And so I kind of knew of it, but um, what what was your thoughts when we got there and the reception we had and all that? Talk us, walk us through okay. a little bit of that. So, so the, the first 20 minutes or so, it's all being uh, going through security. And, and that was pretty intense. And going through barbed wire and having machine guns and all of that stuff, going past the, the guard uh, or the, um, the yard was a little bit intimidating. But when we went through those gym doors and there were, I don't know, 50, 60 cohorts, guys that were imprisoned in there that were so excited to see us, I was blown away. And so almost immediately, my guard went down and I was excited to be there. Uh, and, and, you know, I've done some college incubators and, and some other Shark Tank type experiences. And essentially, that's what we did. We did one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. mentoring. We did Shark Tank uh, judging. And I was just blown away how effective the program was and the impact that it had on these men's lives. Well, and it was it showed the power, a couple different things. I learned so many lessons that day. But yeah. what, the first lesson was, like you said, when we went through those gym doors, they basically had 60 of um, the inmates. They're all lined up and they're all cheering and yeah. yelling excited yeah. for us. And it was one of the most heartwarming receptions I've ever received, which was bizarre because of the situation. You're not expecting to feel that way. Right. But right. you immediately wanted to gravitate towards these prisoners. Well, and, and the woman that put this on, Kath, Kat Hulk, mm -hmm. is remarkable and she's amazing. And and so she had us do this exercise called Walk the Line. Yep. And I think it was probably one of the most powerful experiences that a lot of us had had. So yeah, I would put it in the top five most powerful experiences I've ever. Yeah. Ever. Explain what it was for the audience. All right. So so what happened was we we, we don't call them inmates. We call them cohorts, cohorts. or students, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, so yeah. they got on one side of the line, and then we got on the other side of the line, and we were all asked the same questions. And if it applied to us, we all walked forward. And so at first, the questions I'm trying to think they they eased us into them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And some of the questions really struck me. For example, one of the questions were, how many of you have been in prison uh, by the age of 23? Well, very few of us uh, entrepreneurs that were there went forward, maybe a couple. Mm -hmm. But every cohort was there. And, and then they kept dropping the age, 18, 17, 16. And very quickly, you realize that these guys had mostly lived their entire life in the prison system. Uh, then the question was asked, how many of you would have been in prison had you been caught? Mm -hmm. And almost every one of us walked to the line. And all of a sudden, we were bonding. 
and, and we realized that, but for the grace of God, but for our family, where we were born, how we were raised, it could have been us in there. And so that connection was incredibly powerful. Yeah, the question that really stood out in my mind is at one point she asked, uh, they asked if you had a parent that tucked you in and told you that they loved yeah. you at night. Yeah. And I think of the um, cohort side, the student side, I think there was only one that mm -hmm. stepped forward. And on our side, it was all but like two, yeah. right? And you start to realize like, oh my gosh, like the benefits and the advantages that I had as a child. And maybe, you know, I think a lot of people live in this space where they feel like um, they're disadvantaged in some of these. And some people actually are, as you yes, see. Sir. But then you see people that have no excuse not to have that success. And when you actually see it, to me, it was a sense of gratitude and appreciation for the life that I've been able to have and these advantages that you kind of forget mm -hmm. aren't normal necessarily. Right. right. It, it was really, really powerful. And, and something on a very cool note, just last week, mm -hmm. uh, Kat was at a, a convention up at uh, the Montage up in Deer Valley. And I got about, you know, just 45 minutes with her. But she was speaking at an event and she got three or four scholarships for uh, the, some of the graduates that had been at Pelican Bay when we were there. And, and these guys are out now and they have businesses and not only are they, you know, succeeding at the level that they're at, but every one of them had businesses that they were giving back as well. Mm -hmm. So for example, one of the guys had a, uh, he, he had a traditional job. He had a, a making t-shirt job, but he had another job where he was making uh, phone service affordable to families who didn't have the ability to go and visit their husbands, their fathers inside Pelican Bay. Mm. And so it was just really, really neat to see that desire for those guys to get out and, and make their difference as well. Yeah, for me, I, I loved when just seeing the passion that they had because some of them were in there for life. Yeah. Some of them might not even ever get out, but it gave them so much um, uh, self-fulfillment and so mm -hmm. much confidence to be able to have a business that they were able to shoot for. And a lot of them are getting out, like you said, and a lot of them are starting their own businesses yeah. now and, and doing some really neat things because that's true rehabilitation where you take somebody and you not only, you know, it's one thing, that's one of my issues with, you know, when you give somebody a job or you give them welfare, things like that, it doesn't help that self-confidence. But if you help them and support them through, they come out with such a, a self worth yeah you know that they don't look at themselves as this former prisoner they look at themselves as this business owner yeah. going forward yeah you know the other thing that struck me i think in a really powerful way is entrepreneurship whether it, do, it doesn't matter what your environment is moving forward right moving in a positive direction changes your life it just does the guys that were in solitary confinement mm -hmm. you know they're in solitary confinement I mean, they're in solitary confinement, but they start to study, they start to read, they start to improve themselves, they start to become kind to one another, they start to understand how things connect. Uh, it, it just, it was really remarkable. I understood that with our kids. Mm -hmm. I understood that in our world, but regardless of where your culture is or where you're, um, where you're living, that entrepreneurial skill and mindset is, is life-changing. I, I, I thought that was really powerful. Yeah, I think that is the power of the entire program that Kat's put together and why it's working so well. Mm -hmm. But that was such a fun experience that yeah, we got to share. Um, and, you know, your story kind of is a story of entrepreneurship. When you were, I think, in your late 30s, mm -hmm. um, you found yourself suddenly widowed, single mom with a two-year-old um, child. And you decided in that moment that you were going to go start your own business, raise this money, this capital, um, and and do this. And I guess that's just such a, not a normal response to how I think most people would have handled, you know, um, that grief in that moment or whatever else, or, or, or just even raising a child by yourself. So what was the, take us through your mind in that time frame and okay. how you were able to do such an amazing thing. Okay. So, so I actually made the decision, uh, probably one of the best decisions I've ever made. And, and it was actually, the night my husband passed away, it was in the hospital room before I walked out the door. And, and he, he, um, he'd been in a coma for seven days, and I'd been with him all seven days. And so it's the last day, the seventh day, he, he passes away. And, and I'm looking out 
the, from the room, I'm looking out into the hallway and I'm noticing how busy it is out there. And it just struck me that here my world was collapsing, but it was busy out there. Mm -hmm. and, and it was just a really profound moment for me. And I realized that the minute I walked out of that room, that all of our dreams, all of our goals, uh, life as I knew it was gone. And, and when my dad died, I didn't handle it very well. But now I've got a two-year-old. And so I thought, you know, I am not going to let my son lose both of his parents that night. He wasn't going to lose his dad to cancer, which is what hit him, and then lose me to my grief, my, you know, slipping into depression or disappointment. And so I made the decision right there that every decision that I made thereafter would align with making sure that my son got to live a full and happy childhood. And so when I walked out that door, it was like a, a very, very profound, profound moment for me because my life changed that moment. And, and all of my decisions, you know, aligned with that approach going forward. So I didn't start the business like the next day. It took me about two years. Okay. Uh, and then when I realized that, and I was working for a good company, but when I realized that when the company started to promote me and expand my territory and want me to travel more, it no longer aligned with what my dream was, which was to be there for my son. And, and so that's the day that it was like another line in the sand. I realized that moment that this vehicle called my job of 16 years, it no longer supports my goals and dreams. And I made the decision to quit. And it was a real sudden decision. I mean, I literally went, oh my gosh, it's another line. I raced to my office. I typed up a resignation letter, hopped in my car, drove to Kinko's and overnighted it before I could change my mind. <laughs> and, and then I called my boss and said, hey, you know, I'm giving you my 30 days notice. So 30 days later, I'm sitting on my floor, you know, going, oh my God, what, I, what did I do? But then there was no choice. You know, then I had to succeed. So... And so did you have a background? I mean, I guess you'd worked for this other company for mm -hmm. 16 years, learned a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Had you ever done anything entrepreneurial at that point? So, so I'd worked for a dental insurance company going through college. And that's, that's they actually, I started as the receptionist. And uh, when I graduated, you know, they began to move me around a little bit. And that's what brought me to Utah. Mm. I'd, I'd never had an executive management position. I'd never... Uh, started anything from scratch. I'd never raised capital before. Back then, you know, this was the late 90s. And so venture capital and, and the whole tech movement and all of that, you know, it just wasn't so out there. Mm. And, and so all I knew was that I didn't qualify for a loan. I didn't have any money. And so it, it seemed like the only solution was to do a stock offering. And so that was all I knew to do. So that's what I did. Oh, that's amazing. And so you've raised money just from your idea, essentially, of what you were going to make this business become. Yeah. And so I, I thought about different businesses. I, I really did not believe I was qualified to do an insurance company. Um, I really struggled in math. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, uh, I've never taken an accounting class. I didn't have a business degree. Insurance is a highly regulated, it's considered a financial industry. And so, so that was not my first choice. But I'd been a receptionist and, and I'd served in some other roles. And so I knew that better than anything else. And what I did understand at that point was that my dream was to be there for my son and give him a certain life. The job was my vehicle to support that. And I understood that. And so I had a brother, I still have a brother who's a CPA, and I flew him up from California. He, he sat down and he goes, okay, first step is a business plan. You do the narratives and I'll go do three and five year projections. And, and so that really became like a map for me. And, mm -hmm. and I literally just followed it to the T. I mean, I just followed it. And so, <laughs> so we figured, okay, uh, in order to get a salary, in order to rent a building, in order to do this, this, and this, we need this much money. And, and so uh, that's just how I approached it. And when people would say, can you really raise the money? I mean, I had no choice. <laughs> so I would just say, yeah, that's the easy part. So who did you, who did you contact first to start raising the money? So, so this was my strategy. Um, and it's ended up having a huge influence on my life. So 
So first I get a legal pad and I write everybody's name that I know of that has money anywhere in the world. And I spent about two weeks calling everybody on the list and not one person, not family, not friends, nobody invested. And then out of desperation, I called a friend of my father's who, my father passed away when I was young, but uh, he was a dentist and he'd kind of been involved in my life when I was a kid. And, um, and I called him and I asked him to invest. And he, he goes, no, nah, it's just too risky. I'm not going to do it. But he told me a story about my dad and how my dad had tried to get him to invest. Mm. And he wouldn't do it. And so my dad showed up at his doorstep uh, with two plane tickets and said, you're flying to New York with me. We're going to talk to a banker. And while they were in the air, my dad convinced him to co-sign on a loan. And, and when he told me that, what struck me is, you know, I, I'm the apple of my father's eye. And so I quit asking people for money and I began to brag about people because what my dad did is my dad decided to build a building and anybody that came along. Oh, OK. So this is OK. What this man told me is he goes, it's the only investment I ever made money on. And your dad just brought me along on it. And when he said that, mm. that clicked. And I thought, I'm the apple of my dad's eye. I'm going to make this thing happen. And anybody that comes along, they're going to do well. So when I'd run into people or if anybody called, I would just, they'd say, hey, Gina, what are you doing? And this is what I'd tell them. I'd say, I'm building a business. And it's going to be a vehicle to help us achieve our goals, dreams, and visions. Not only is it going to be a great investment, it's going to create hundreds of jobs. And we're going to be able to support causes that we're passionate about. And, and one by one, people began to say, we want to invest. And so I had friends, former employees, colleagues, the guy at Kinko's, um, <laughs> somebody at a funeral, you know, somebody I met at the VA hospital. Because if anybody asked me, you know, what do you do? How are you? I casted the vision, and when I shared the vision, and when I shared what was in it for them, people wanted to be a part of it. Wow, it's so powerful. It's because when you're trying to sell people on the money making, or you know, invest X amount, I'll give you X amount back. They're, they're, they, it's hard to see a vision, especially since you didn't have a background in that. But the second you built that vision, and you got to preview for them what it meant, um, of course they wanted to invest with you. Well. Fast forward 15 years later, okay. your company um, ends up becoming four companies mm -hmm. and you sell it off to Blue Cross Blue Shield. I'm guessing all those investors did very well. The, the investors did well. I mean, and it was funny because it took a lot longer than I thought. My business plan was three to five years mm -hmm. and it took 15 years. And uh, But during those 15 years, you had the dot-com crash, you had all these crashes. So when people would call me and they'd say, my shareholders would call and they'd say, um, hey, any chance we can get the money, you know? <laughs> and I go, well, well, here's the good news. I didn't lose it, you know? Yeah, if you would have I had it in the stocks had you or, had it anywhere any, else. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so that kind of worked to my advantage. But everybody was happy. I didn't have a lot of shareholders. I had about 15. Mm -hmm. Now, what a great opportunity for them, too, to be able to kind of go on and be able to cheer for you along mm -hmm. the way. Right? I like to invest in my friends' companies because I kind of become their cheerleader. Yeah. And anything I can do to help out at that point, I'm going to do whatever I can. as I'm, I would anyway, but it's just fun to take the ride along with them. So, and, and here's, what, I've, here's what, what happened to me is that there's no way I could have failed because I had shareholders and I had, you know, one by one, I had employees and I was so accountable to them that when things got really, really rough, which, which they just do when you're building a business, uh, I don't think, I think I always had my son and I think that was my motive, but having shareholders really made me sacrifice, made me work harder and, and made sure that I succeeded because I wasn't going to lose anybody's money. Yeah. You were held accountable mm -hmm. to those people that trusted in you. Yeah. Well, what did that feel like when this multi-billion dollar company wants to acquire you? Do you remember um, kind of how it came about? Yeah, so it was real strategic, actually. Um, my goal was to have at least three companies that we had, we were responsible for, my goal was 20% of their revenues mm. so that I would be able to create a bidding war. And, and so that's essentially what I did. And, you know, the story's not quite as clean as that. It, <laughs> it was a little bit more complicated. But, uh, but I knew from about 
uh, I mean, I knew halfway through who my potential acquirers were. And so this was a strategic partner. Mm-hmm. Each, of the, each of the potential buyers were a strategic partner. So essentially, I was able to get a bidding war going. And, and this particular company, we represented quite a bit of income and revenue for them. And so I sold two of the companies to Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, mm-hmm. and then two of the companies to one of their subsidiaries, which each by themselves were multi-billion dollar companies, uh, Companion Life Insurance. So... Wow. And you had how many employees at the time that you sold the company? Right around between 50 and 60 at any given time. Yeah. yeah. And I know when you talk about a couple of your employees in the early days, you had your babysitter, mm-hmm. your karate instructor, yeah. um, a guy that you met flipping burgers, you know. Um, I guess you were able to help so many people, elevate so many people through having this career in this company. But at what point does the experience matter? At what point were you just betting on the jockeys? Well, so I am really proud of our employees, really, really proud. Um, I got to, to help put together the succession plan when I stepped down mm. and my executive management team, you know, most of them had been with me since they were teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I'm really proud of that. But so I was a regulated company, you know, an insurance carrier. Uh, I understood how weak I was in finance. And so I asked my brother, who was a CPA, to, to be my CFO. He never worked on site. He, was, he, he had his practice, but, but, but he guided me quite a bit. I made sure that my controller was a CPA. Uh, I had two CPAs on the board. So, so I kind of surrounded myself with people. Uh, I relied on my attorney really heavily in the early days. Mm. And so my team was young. My team was young, and if you interview them now, uh, I just, my very first employee I had lunch with this last summer, and I hadn't seen her in a few years, and she goes, I just couldn't believe that you hired me <laughs> and that you treated me like an adult, you know? And and I totally relied on them, but they were creative. They mm-hmm. had a lot to prove, and I was able to train them and mentor them. So legal, I I relied on my attorney quite a bit. Finance, I relied on my financial people. As we got bigger, as as we were going after big big accounts, state of Arizona, for example, mm. then I needed to, I needed to be able to have people with credentials as well. But in the early years, it it were. It, you know, I don't know that I had anybody with a college diploma. Well, and I think one of the advantages that you had is kind of when I started in real estate, I was 24 years mm-hmm. old. And I, you know, people would, I'd go interview and I'd say, look, what I lack in experience is going to be your greatest advantage because yeah. I'm going to be hustling that much harder. Yeah. You know, I'm going to put all my focus on you. And so I always tell younger real estate agents as they're getting in the business, like if you're trying to go up against me, I've sold almost 2000 homes. They're going to pick me unless you can sell them on the benefits of you. And it's not going to be on experience. So Mm -hmm. what else are you bringing to the table? I think that's kind of what you said is these young people had a lot to prove as well. They wanted to, you know, honor the fact that you'd given them this opportunity. And so they were willing to do. Right. Right. (coughs) You know, and, and with technology being what it is, I even everything I'm doing right now, I've surrounded myself with a team of young people. You know, mm-hmm. and and it's it's not that I'm prejudiced against older people. I, I mean, I look at I look at the pictures of my going away party, and and it's a really nice mix of all kinds of ages. But I'm proud of the fact that we built a company on unlikely employees, and and I think that it supports the premise that success is not based on. This, I don't believe if you use me as an example, my success is not based on my education my credentials, or my strengths. Mm. It's based on understanding that where I am today doesn't support where I want to be, coming up with a plan and a strategy that works and following it. And the same thing applies with our employees. And so if you get an employee that is teachable, that is trainable, that will follow the plan and then bring in their creativity and their strengths, it's way fun. Mm. You know, there's a tremendous energy. It's a lot of fun to do that. Did it ever scare you not having some more advanced people in the company? Because you were new to entrepreneurship, to owning your own business too. It sounds like you relied a lot on your brother and had some other people that were helping you. But were, was there ever a time where you're like, this isn't going to work or we're going to, you know, you, were you ever worried that you just weren't going to make it? So it just wasn't an option. And and I and, and I know I you that. get this. I, I, I love mean, that. Yeah, I know you get it. And, and there are people that speak against saying failure is not an option. 
failure wasn't an option for me. You know, it, it might be fuel for the, you know, the new direction we had to go, but it, it, it was not an option. And so I don't, I didn't allow myself to, to get fearful. I just, you know, I always felt like, you know, I've, if, if I need money and, and I don't have it in sales and I need to keep knocking on doors, you mm-hmm. know, I need to keep making the phone calls. And I figured as long as I kept following the plan and doing what I needed to do, that that I would be okay. I had to be. Yeah. I mean, there just wasn't an option. Yeah. I love when I have a big goal. I like to tell people because the more you can take away the option of being able to fail, yeah. the harder you're going to push for it to succeed. I, I When I coach young real estate agents, I ask them, I say, hey, if this doesn't work out, if you're not making sales, what are you going to go do to make money? And one guy, you know, he's like, I'm going to go drive Uber. Another one said, I'm going to go do this. I said, well, then you're probably going to fail at this. Mm -hmm. I said, because you still have a plan B. I said, you got to toss your hat over the fence. You got to go get it, burn the bridges, uh, the boats, as they like to say, and go 100%. This cannot fail. I'm going to make this succeed. Yeah. Well, so so when I had lunch with this first employee of mine last summer, uh, what was funny is I asked her to tell me some of the moments that, uh, you know, were defining moments for her, you know, in the early stages of the company. And one of the defining moments she had was, she goes, one day, it was just you and I in this little office. And she goes, one day you walked by and you said, how many groups did we sell this month? And, she, and I asked her that. And Amanda goes, 38, because she was busy setting them up. Well, in, for a little insurance carrier, 38 groups, you know, a startup, I, I'd, I'd never believed we could do that well. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it was like... And so just in passing, I went, I went, um, wow, that's amazing in, in all of my life. You know, even in my career before, I've never seen that many sales in a month. And, and she told me, she goes, that struck me because you had never set a limit on us. Mm-hmm. We didn't know, <laughs> you know, she goes, I didn't know that was good. <laughs> and so I, I thought that was pretty interesting. Oh, that's amazing. My first day I ever, I was out selling steak and chicken door to door. This was like my first job <laughs> as an adult. And I didn't know what was good or yeah. not. And I went out my first day in an hour and a half, sold like six of these huge cases of steak. Each had 50, 60 steaks. And I got back and, you know, everyone else had sold one or two. And I didn't realize, I was like disappointed I didn't have more to sell. I sold everything I had, but I didn't realize what was good. And it's just, it's funny, like the things we can do when we don't know yeah. the limits that are placed upon yeah. us. So I was really uh, inspired by a Tom Peters video when mm. I was in college. I mean, in my 20s, really inspired. And and what it was, was he'd written a book, uh, In Search of Excellence, where he interviewed all of the big companies to find out what common traits they had. And then uh, he did a second book, A Passion for Excellence, where he interviewed the individual entrepreneur that made $30 million in a corner grocery store that shouldn't have. And after they studied each of the entrepreneurs, the conclusion they came to was that the entrepreneurs that they interviewed that had done above and beyond what they should have, they hadn't gone to business school. And, and he concluded mm-hmm. with, they were too naive to know they couldn't. And, and that really inspired me. Mm-hmm. And so I would say that all the time. I'm just going to be naive. I'm just going to be naive. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this right. You know, I'm going to have the proper systems and processes in place. Insurance, too, we had to have surplus and reserves so, mm-hmm. so that you know, we'd always have adequate funds. So probably being regulated was good for me. Yeah, because it kept you with that security and certainty of having some money. Yeah, and I mean, it was terrifying because so like with every sale that we made, you know, the goal was to hit 50,000, right? 50,000 new members and you couldn't celebrate it very long because that meant you had to put more money in your your surplus Mm -hmm. and reserves. So it was always kind of a danged if you did and danged if you didn't. (laughs) But, But it did keep me out of a certain amount of trouble, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, so after you got done, you know, you sold your business, you stayed on as the CEO and president for a while, but in 2016, you stepped away to start your own coaching coaching and consulting company um, called Jane Ann Craig International, correct? Yeah. And so what was, what what was the why behind that? Why did you decide to go into this next phase of your life? So, so when you're building a business, we all have different reasons why, right? I mean, I, I did it uh, primarily because I wanted to give my son a certain lifestyle. I also wanted to have a voice in the community. I wanted to gain wealth so that I could support causes I was passionate about. So, so I was really, really purpose-driven. The other thing, though, as a business, you're, you're trying to get your company 
institutionalized to the point that it runs and it makes money without you, right? Mm -hmm. And and so institutionalization is the best word that I can think of. Michael Gerber, EMIT, oh, yeah. so that the processes and systems put out a predictable and profitable outcome each and every day. So that was always my goal. So when I sold the company to Blue Cross, part of the contract was that I had to stay on for three years. And all of a sudden, the things that we had tried so hard to do, you know, budgets and forecasting and things that we did early on, but as we grew, got more and more difficult. All of a sudden, we had to function as a federal contractor in a multi-billion dollar organization, you know. And, and so it was a real fun experience the first three years because, you know, this is, I believe that when we step out and we do something like start a business, you know, we make mistakes, we, we do all kinds of things, but it's in that navigating through the consequences of our mistakes that we build relationships, we build confidence, we build our skills, we build our reputation. And so I got to do that in a startup to being, you know, a fairly successful company. Now I got to do that in a multi-billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty cool for a season. But then it quit being so cool for me uh, because it was so institutionalized. So that was one reason. Um, another reason is that I wanted to make sure that my executive team got a chance to assume the role that, you know, the role that I had assumed. And, and so the timing seemed really appropriate. There were changes going on in Blue Cross. I felt like if I left when I did, it would assure my VP, who I more or less promised the role of CEO, that he would get that opportunity. And so some of it had to do with succession. And then the other is just, I still have my goal and my dream. And, and I felt like it was time to move on and, and make a bigger splash, if you will. And so what's been the biggest reward of having your own company where you're helping others with their visions and their goals? Do you have some examples of some of the type of clients that you're taking on and what you get to do for them? Walk us through kind of the, what you get to do for them. Okay. Them. Well, so, so the last couple of years have been really fun. Uh, I, I'm really big on plan, you know, business plans and all of that. But for my own personal life, my plan had really been to quit my job and to write a book. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to lose my, because I felt like that way I could teach and get the message out to a larger audience, if you will. But I, I didn't want to not be involved with people. And so when I left, I, I wanted to have clients immediately, but just enough, I mean, just enough to to keep involved in the community and, and know that I was making a difference. You know, I didn't have employees around me anymore. And so my, my, uh, literally the week that I quit, I picked up three or four clients and, and they were businesses that maybe were 10 years in that, um, were wanting to go to acquisition. And so the kind of coaching that I did there was really only, you know, I, I kind of think of a mentor like a whitewater guide. They they know where the the rocks and the the danger zones are. They also know the where the eddies are. Paths are. And yeah, yeah. And so, as a CEO that has gone through in in the time that I built my company, we had a couple of attempted hostile takeovers. You know, there were partnership issues. There are just things that happen in business mm -hmm. that you don't expect, and I can see that. Where, uh, you know, another CEO that hasn't been through it before, you know, they don't see it. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that they've got a shareholder problem going on or, or they got a regulatory problem or, hey, you just violated HR code, even though what you meant to do was, was well-meaning. That's a lawsuit. And so, and so that's been really, really fun. Uh, but I think what's been more fun than anything else has been working with some startup, I mean, young people, again, that uh, are just starting out mm -hmm. and, and they've got gr just really beautiful ideas and they've got passion, but they, they don't know quite what to do with it. And so that has been maybe the most rewarding. So, so one of my, one of my um, uh, students, if you will, was a real estate, a young real estate guy. And he, he had that entrepreneurial spirit in him. And so he was looking at everything but real estate. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he just started calling saying, hey, could, could we meet over a soda pop and could we talk? 
and then it turned into a relationship. You know, now he's a six digit, doing very, very well, realtor. And it was just focus. It was just focus. Another young man that I'm working with, uh, beautiful ideas. I mean, really great ideas and, and dealing with huge sums of money just doesn't, uh, didn't know how to focus in on, on his, um, profit centers. And, you know, sometimes you have so many ideas that it, it, you can be really, really busy being busy. Mm -hmm. And so literally I've just helped to sort through that. But most of my focus really, honestly, the last two years have been on speaking mm -hmm. and writing. Well, I was going to say, that's kind of the next thing I want to jump into is you just came out with your book, yes. The Audit Principle. Yes. It's an interesting name. Walk us through why you decided to okay. call it that and then what the steps of the book are. Yeah. And so I actually, I was trying to come up with a more provocative name because I didn't want the book to get relegated to a tax shelf, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but but I couldn't, I, I definitely wanted it to say The Audit Principle because that, that is so significant to me. Uh, and so this, the, the book title is... The Audit Principle, Five Powerful Steps to Aligning Your Life with the Law of Success. So not, not too provocative, uh, but, but where it came from is this, is being a regulated company, we were audited and we were audited every three to five years. It became very routine. Mm -hmm. First time it happened, it was not routine. And, and I get this call, you know, two weeks ahead of right before the holidays saying, hey, we're going to be audited at the first of the year. And, and I wouldn't have said panicked. But I, I was concerned because in an, in an audit, they send ex examiners are paid to find your deficiencies mm. and the consequences can be really expensive. Right. And so I decided to go into my office every night for a couple of weeks and do a pre audit. And, and my mission was catch and correct. And, and I figured I'd catch a few things. I just didn't realize how many things that I would catch. <laughs> and so it was the second night I'm sitting in my office and I'm going through documents and I'm going, oh, wow, not, everything's not signed. And, and I'm realizing, oh, shoot, you know, we didn't, we didn't put this process in place. We meant to. And in, in about 30 minutes, I realize we are not ready to, to be audited. We may not pass this. And, and so what happened from that is, is I found myself going through three very distinct phases. And the first stage was... Um, Denial. It was like, Jane Ann, just keep digging. You know, surely it's here. And, and you can only waste so much time on denial if you're honest. Mm -hmm. The second stage, though, was excuses. And, and we had really, really good excuses. For the time that they were auditing us, we, we had really relied on one strategic partner. They went out of business. I mean, they were paying our claims. They were doing a bunch of stuff for us. And they went out of business. So I decided, well, I'll buy a company, which was a story in and by itself. It was challenging, right? Sure. But I'll buy a company to get the license so we can put all of our business onto that. And, and then the Olympics came to Utah. And uh, the governor shut down the state for, I think, 30 days when my hearing was supposed to happen. And, and while the state is shut down, the company that we're buying decides to do a hostile takeover. I mean... In the time that we were audited, we went through financial challenges, we went through strategic partner going out of business, we went through a hostile takeover, and I got diagnosed with breast cancer. Oh and so I went through surgeries, infections, recovery, fighting for my life. And so I had really good excuses why maybe some things had slipped through the cracks, right? But then I realized excuses weren't getting anywhere getting me anywhere. And so I slipped into a third phase and that was a uh, blame. And I started to point fingers at people. You know, I pointed fingers at the governor for the Olympics, you know, <laughs> I mean the regulators. And, but the minute I started to blame people, I love, you know, while I'm fighting for my life, surely so-and-so could have done this, this, and this. The minute I slipped into that, it was like, I had a, I call it a revelation because it was so deep for me. And, and, and here's what it is, is that in an audit, denial, excuses, and blame, they're not relevant. Mm -hmm. They're not relevant. They're thieves. They're, they're time thieves. They just distract us and take us away from achieving what our goal was. In this case, it was just a routine audit. And, and I realized in that moment that the purpose of an audit is nothing more than to determine if you're aligned, if you're in compliance with the law of success. And if you're not, get rid of the denial, the excuses, and the blame, and get on it. 
Well, that's such a good principle because I think in life too many times people try to use excuses or blame and those things. And it's, I always tell people, hey, you, you can even be right. You can be right about all these reasons that this happened to you, but you said something very important. It doesn't serve you. It's mm -hmm. not helping you. Then and how? that's kind of what you hinted yeah. at towards right there. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so a bunch of really good stuff came out of the audit. I mean, the very next day I went to my staff, I rounded them up and said, Hey, you know, I got insight last night. No more denial, excuses, or blame. When something's not working, we're going to celebrate that we caught it. And then we're going to figure out where we are, where we need to be, and what we need to do to get in compliance. Mm -hmm. And and so it, it's really practical. It's practical from processes and systems, but culture. Like if one of my employees came to me and said I had hurt somebody's feeling or the culture was getting negative, I want to deny it. And then, I, and then if I have to own it, then I want to start making excuses and say, well, I was busy or I've been traveling or how can you expect this? And then if that doesn't work, I want to, I want to go, well, if that person wasn't so darn sensitive, you know, I did this or this and this for them. And instead, you know, I just learned or, or I just learned to own it and, and ask for forgiveness. And then let's move on. How do we fix that? Or IT, they may have spent a year putting together a system but it doesn't work for marketing, you know, and the IT may deny it. They may make excuses and they may blame, but do we want to waste time doing that? Or do we want to assess where we're at, figure out where we want to go and then celebrate that together? And so it, it, I believe it's, it's, it's Newton's third law. You know I mean? It literally, it's, it's a universal law that is so relevant. Um, the one that I oftentimes give people is if you want to lose weight, you know, you've got to get in compliance with the law of losing weight. And and we start talking about business travel and you go, yeah, it's, it's hard to lose weight when you travel, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you're, you're entertaining. Um, you eat you're three meals a day. Eating eating out, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's you and I just, just right easily went into denial. Uh, excuses, mm -hmm. right? Blame. But, but the thing is, is that the minute you have a high school reunion, the minute you've got your kid is getting married, all of a sudden you go, I need to fit in that tuxedo or that gown on this date. You pick a strategy that's going to work and you follow it. Mm -hmm. You get in compliance with the laws of losing weight. So simple, simple principle, but it to me it was life-changing. And so I believe it applies to marriage. It applies to every area of life. And so that's why I wrote the book is, is to go, guys, you know, there's this myth. Too many people, they don't start businesses. They don't go after their goals or dreams because they don't believe they're qualified. They, they don't believe they have the money. They don't believe they, they um, have the experience. And I didn't have any of those, you know, and yet I built a successful company. And, and so the purpose of the book, the purpose of my speaking is really more than anything is, is to say, hey, if somebody like me with my weaknesses, my deficiencies and my hangups, can do what I did. Imagine what you can do with your strengths and, and with your ideas, you know? Yeah. Well, I think it's, I'm excited to read the book. I actually already bought it. Thank um, you. Yes. But, um, I was, it didn't have an audio version yet. And so I, I am waiting for it to come in the mail. So I'll let you know, but I'm excited because it is such a true principle that, you know, there's a roadmap to success, whether it's losing weight or owning mm -hmm. a business or being financially in a good position. There's, you know, there's science to this. And if you follow the map, mm -hmm. you're going to get to where you, and I love the idea of an audit or just simply being able to look at it and getting it in compliance, as you said, where it's aligned together to work the way it's supposed to. So, so the book isn't about an audit at all. And that's, right. that's, just, you know, that's, but the idea of getting in compliance with where you're supposed yeah. to be, right. Yeah. Like not blaming or putting that. I call it the audit principle because it's where I got the insight of compliance. Right. Um, and really it's because that's where, where I caught it, but it, it really is about what you just said. It's a roadmap to success. It, it really is. Mm -hmm. And, and I think we make things too complicated. We just make things too complicated. You know, if we can get rid of the clutter mm -hmm. and, and the mess, you know, there's very little we can't do. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. Well, you've done so many things. You've got so many great things going on. What, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want people to look back on, you know, Jane Ann and what you've done and what do you, what would you like them to say about you as far as your legacy goes? You know, I, I've not spent a lot of time on legacy. 
so the first thing that comes to mind is that I made a difference, you know, I, and, and, and that I did all the way, I kept moving all the way to the end, that I didn't stop. Um, I ended up asking my son to write the foreword on my book, and, and he wrote something that really encouraged me, and I realized that I, I think this is an area that probably most parents, working parents, struggle with. Um, but, but my son in the foreword, you know, he talked about our story, and, and, um, and he said something, he goes, my mom became extraordinary so she could do something ordinary which is to be my mom, which I think is extraordinary. And that's awesome. Yeah, it, it's really awesome. And, and that's probably the most, the, the, the thing I'm most proud about. And, um, and I've shared that with, you know, even before I had the book published, I was sharing that with a handful of, of women. And, and I think it applies to men and, and women as well. And I realize that if that's all anybody catches that, you know, despite our circumstances, despite the fact that we're working, that we can make a huge impact in our kids' lives, in our community's lives, is, is remarkable and it's amazing. And so I, I think of that message, I, I think of the, the message out of any time I speak to anybody is, is usually, and I don't mean it to be self-deprecating, I want it to be encouraging, is this, is that if somebody like me with my hang-ups and weaknesses and deficiencies can achieve extraordinary success. Anybody can, and and we need to learn to be encouraged by other people's successes, you know, because you know we're all created to make our difference. Yeah, and I think, and that's kind of most of the guests that I've had on the podcast because it is a podcast to highlight extraordinary people, and and it is one of the things about all the different. There's so many extraordinary people, and they're all ordinary in their own mm -hmm. way but they've all decided to be extraordinary in their lives just like you did. They just said, I'm going to do this. This is going to be something that I get done. And then they strive towards yeah. that goal. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to go do another fun adventure with you, uh, whether it's Defy or whatever else it might be, Jane. And thank you so much for your time. And this was a pleasure once again. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me to be on this thing. Of course.